Hi guys, this is GSNL.com and I'm here with the Samsung Galaxy S6 for a detailed pre-review. We've already reviewed the Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge in a pre-release version and we did that in great detail. This is the 2015 Samsung flagship phone. It was announced on March 1st at Mobile World Congress 2015 and we were there to see it debuting. Well, this is a pre-release version, so some bugs and features may be lacking for now, but overall it's a pretty complete device. I have to say that the products will be shipped and in stores on April 10th, so we're lucky to have it early. The price tag on the Samsung UK website is officially 600 British pounds, which equates $897 right now. As far as the design goes, the handset comes in black sapphire, white pearl, gold platinum, which is this version here, that looks like a mirror, and blue topaz. The thickness is 6.8 millimeters, which is actually a lot thinner than the Galaxy S5 that was 8.1 millimeters in thickness, and it weighs 138 grams, while the Galaxy S5, the predecessor, weighed 145 grams. It's also 2 millimeters more narrow compared to the Galaxy S5, and it's made of glass and metal this time instead of polycarbonate. So it keeps the 5.1 inch diagonal for the screen, increases the resolution and now we get a metal frame that's sandwiched between two pieces of glass at the front and at the back with Gorilla Glass 4 protection. The device feels pretty solid in spite of the use of glass, it's not slippery and it's very easy easily used with one hand as you can see right here. I have to say that the weight is pretty well balanced and uh, there is no longer water and dust resilience as you may have guessed. The battery is now non removable, there is no micro SD card slot and I have to say that the glass is better implemented than on the Sony Xperia devices. Now at the front we got the earpiece right here, we got the front camera here, we got sensors here and if I'm not mistaken there should be the LED flash uh, excuse me, the LED notification here somewhere. Now we got the display right here and below it there's the physical home button with fingerprint scanner embedded and the back capacitive button and recent capacitive buttons also in place. Now at the back we have the main camera here, the LED flash and the usual pulse sensor right here. The camera protrudes but only a little bit, not as much as one would expect after seeing the renders. I have to say that the back of the phone is a big fingerprint magnet, as you can see right here, but it has a pretty nice color effect when submitted to light. At the top we find the infrared emitter and a microphone, while at the bottom we find the micro USB, another microphone, audio jack and a speaker right here. On the left side we can find peel shaped volume buttons with good feedback, while on the right side we got the on off button that's very small and very thin, has good feedback and there's a nano sim card slot right next to it. Uh, the device comes with rounded corners, as you can well see, it has comfy edges, it's not uh, that type of metal that cuts into your palm, it's that type of comfy metal, and the bottom part, also the top part, resemble the iPhone 6 a little bit. This is clearly a more premium handset compared to the predecessor and predecessors, and it makes a few sacrifices like the micro SD and the battery, the first non-existent and the second non-removable. Also, the presence of glass means extra fragility compared to a polycarbonate device. Now the question we're obviously asking is, was it worth it to replace polycarbonate with glass and metal? I would have to say yes, because this is a very nice looking device, it has a very premium feel and now nobody can complain that it's, it uses cheap materials compared to the iPhone for example. And once again, this gold version is a bit of a fingerprint magnet, but this one and the other versions have a very premium feel to them and also they feel quite solid in spite of using so much glass. Now we move on to the hardware where we receive a 5.1 inch screen, it's a Super AMOLED display with a resolution of 2560 over 1440 pixels. Inside the phone you will be able to find an Exynos 7420 processor, which is a 64-bit unit and it's an octa-core chip. It includes four cores of the Cortex-A57 kind, clocked at 2.1 GHz, and four cores of the Cortex-A53 kind, clocked at 1.5 GHz. This model uses the Mali-7, excuse me, Mali-T760 GPU, and also comes with 3 GB of RAM, and your choice of 32, 64, or 128 GB of storage. At the back, we got a 16 megapixel camera with an LED flash, while at the front there's a 5 megapixel shooter for selfies. On the connectivity side, 
we get LTE category 6, Wi-Fi A, B, G, N, A, C, Wi-Fi dual band, there's also GPS, GLONASS, NFC, infrared, Bluetooth 4.1, and there's also Wi-Fi direct and micro USB 2.0 with MHL3 if you want to do some video output. In the section we like to call others, there's a heart rate sensor here, fingerprint scanner, accelerometer, gyroscope, proximity sensor, compass, barometer, and an oxygen uh, pulse sensor. Now, as far as the battery goes, this model comes with a 2550 mAh battery, it's a lithium-ion unit, and it's theoretically a downgrade from the 2800 mAh unit of the Galaxy S5. This model also brings um, wireless charging on some versions all over the world, and if you're wondering about the actual time the battery lasted, here we go. So what we're dealing with here is a handset that offered us 9 hours and 19 minutes of HD video playback in a loop with Wi-Fi on and brightness at 50%. This is just good, it's not very impressive, it's just slightly impressive. If you consider that the Galaxy S6 Edge gave us 10 hours and 47 minutes, the Galaxy S5 gave us 11 hours and finally the iPhone 6 gave us 11 hours and a half. Also we did a PC mark test that simulates continuous usage of the device and we achieved 7 hours and 6 minutes and uh, this one usually involves uh, a simulation of browsing, photo editing and other activities more data here including temperatures and other ratings anyway 7 hours and 6 minutes in the meantime the OnePlus One achieves 5 hours and 15 minutes and the Samsung Galaxy A5 6 hours and 51 minutes so I would say we're doing okay in this aspect the charging, well, the charging is very impressive. In total, it takes, it took us at least one hour and ten minutes to get this device to charge, which is actually the fastest charging we've ever measured here at gsmdome.com. And finally, in order to achieve a 90% charge, it only took us 50 minutes from 0%, which is yet again impressive. Meanwhile, the Galaxy S6 Edge required one hour and 25 minutes of charging to get to full. Anyway, keep that in mind, 1 hour and 10 minutes of charging is enough to juice up the phone. Meanwhile, the iPhone 6 requires 2 hours and 10 minutes, Galaxy S5 a bit under 2 hours, so I would say we're doing very fine in the charging area. Now, as far as the settings are concerned, we go to the battery area to see an estimation of the use, and obviously the power saving mode, that will limit the maximum CPU performance, reduce screen brightness and frame rate, turn off vibration and other stuff like that. Then there's ultra power saving mode that will make the interface uh, black and white and deactivate some features and keep everything to the minimal bare necessary. Using this mode you should be able with 10% battery to achieve about 24 hours of usage at least on paper. Now we're done with the battery, keep in mind that at continuous work it's pretty good, charging is excellent but the playback time could have been just a little bit better. As far as the acoustics are concerned we get a singular speaker here at the bottom and the video player or better said the audio player in this case has a changed icon you can see it right here the brand new icon and a brand new interface very minimalistic no more lines no more edges but we do get some settings that we knew from before so aside from play speed music auto off and smart volume that we already knew there's sound alive which is basically the equalizer with a totally new interface there are the options related to music types and then there is this knob to um, amplificate the bass or the treble then there's this other knob for the instrument and vocal settings there is the details area that was usually associated with the custom experience and in this area you can tweak one of these seven channels or activate these toggles for 3d bass clarity concept and then play with these options adapt sound if you want to tweak a new pair of headphones sound alive plus if you want to create the effect of rich surround and tube amp if you want to simulate that Okay, so those are all the options we, can to play, we get to play with. Now let's actually listen to a tune or two. Let's turn up the volume. Thank you. 
Okay, now let's draw some conclusions. I have to say that this sound is loud, clear, crisp, we have a good bass, good high notes, good guitar, and the sound is usually warm. We also use the decibel meter to measure the performance of the device sound-wise. And let's see what we achieved. This is the decibel meter showing us a level of 89 decibels, which you'll see in the full text review. I would say this is very good. The Galaxy Note 4 had 89.5 decibels, the OnePlus One had 90.5 decibels, and the iPhone 6 Plus 83 decibels. So, with 89 decibels, I would say we're doing quite fine. We don't have a pair of headphones here offered with this pre-release version, but if you saw our analysis of the Galaxy S6 Edge, it's exactly the same pair of headphones with an elongated body, an elongated remote, flat wire, they go deep in the ear and they resemble the Apple AirPods slightly, but the experience is basically perfect. I would have to say that the acoustic experience is the best we've had on Android this year, so we're waiting for a challenger that would probably come from HTC, just a prediction so far. Now we move on to the video side of things, where there's a 5.1 inch screen here, Super AMOLED Quad HD, 577 ppi, and the bezels are narrow, not hugely narrow, like on some sharp phones, but they're pretty narrow. Anyway, let's go to the video player. It has also received a revamp of the UI. There are no lines anymore, everything is minimalistic, it's been simplified, it supports a lot of codecs, but not the AC3 and DTS. Okay, so if you want to see this test sample, let's check it out. Okay, so here we go. First things first, I have to say that the pop-up play finally works faster. We've seen pop-up play on a ton of devices and none of them were as fast as this one when it came to actually using it. There is the aspect ratio option and the options are quite limited here. The subtitles have quite a few settings, as you can see here, which is kind of impressive. And the actual experience offers you the following. A bright and crisp screen with wide viewing angles and there's also a perfect contrast, no oversaturation in spite of the vivid colors. The blacks are very deep, the behavior in full sunlight is excellent, and the text is crisp when seen on the screen. If you want to get technical, well, with the microscope and a lux meter, and things got really technical. These are the screen's pixels. This one is a diamond-shaped pentile matrix that the screen uses. Basically, it uses OLED sub-pixels of different sizes. We also measure the lux level, which is basically the brightness. This is a lux meter, and it measured the brightness on a white background on the device, and we achieved a level of 475 lux units on the manual slider option. And then we use the auto slider to achieve 467 lux units by using an LED light placed near the sensor. So 475 and 467 lux units tops. We're obviously going to make a comparison since the maximum level achieved here is basically 475 lux. Keep in mind that the Galaxy S5 offered 480 lux, Galaxy Note 4 682 lux, which is crazy good, and the iPhone 6 Plus 623 lux. The latter two are a bit overkill and I would have to say that you can actually feel we are below the brightness of the Galaxy Note 4, which was a device with a hugely bright screen. However, this one is still a pretty bright screen, I cannot complain about it, still it's 477, 75 lux, which is quite good. Um, still less bright than the Galaxy Note 4, however, we got great colors here and we got some settings to play with the screen. Keep in mind, if you want to play a game or watch a video, you'll benefit from Quad HD resolution and a bright screen. And these are the options that I get to play with. Brightness, auto or manual, some font options. Pretty cool one. Screen timeout, smart stay that we've known for a few generations of Samsung phones. And screen modes. There's adaptive display that will adapt to the app you're using. There's AMOLED Cinema with a bit of oversaturation, actually strong oversaturation. AMOLED Photo, a bit more realistic but still oversaturated and basic which makes the image totally realistic and makes the colors feel a bit washed out. So overall a good screen but not better than one of the Galaxy Note 4 or the iPhone 6 Plus at least in the brightness area. However the colors are clearly better. Now as far as the cameras go, 60 megapixel here, 5 megapixel here and both of them share the aperture f1.9 aperture. At the back as far as I've heard there is a Sony INX 240 sensor, which is the same one from the Galaxy Note 4, but with slight improvements. 
Among them we got Auto HDR that's available at all time. Now let's actually check out the camera UI and use this castle here. So the interface has become more minimalistic now compared to the one of the Galaxy S5. Everything is white, everything includes text, smaller icons. On the left side of the screen we got effects, we got HDR set on on, off or auto, we got a timer, we got flash options and then we got the settings. The settings are separated like on the Nexus 6. We got the uh, resolution for the shots, which is 16 megapixels in 16 to 9, 12 megapixels in 4 to 3, or 8.9 megapixels in 1 to 1. There's also the video resolution, UHD, which is 4K, Quad HD, Full HD at 60, 60 frames per second, and Full HD at 30 frames per second. There's tracking autofocus if you want to track a subject, video stabilization, grid lines, location tags, review pictures, quick launch, voice control, volume keys and reset settings. So quick launch, let's give it a go. Basically you can trigger the camera by quickly pressing the home button wherever you are on the device which is kind of cool. Okay now on the right side we got the shortcut for the gallery, for the video capture, shutter button, front camera shortcut and then the modes. This is a transparent area with the main capture modes, they include auto, pro, selective focus, panorama, slow motion, fast motion, virtual shot and some more that you can download. Pro will bring up a few manual tweaks to the experience, of course we still have effects, then there is metering as an extra, there is also this one for the focusing if I'm not mistaken, there is white balance, ISO, exposure and an area with presets, theoretically they are filters, basically they are combos of options that you can tweak, temperature, tint, contrast, saturation, highlight and shadows, they can be saved into a pack and kept like a preset. Ok, other than that we get selective focus that takes a series of shots with various focuses and then allows you to refocus after the shot, panorama, slow motion and fast motion video, this one is 720p at 120 frames per second, virtual shot you spin around the subject and create sort of a rotating 3D panorama and that's about it. Let's go back to auto and see what else we got here. Since everyone is talking about the front camera, let's give it a go. So. This is it, the selfie camera with effects, HDR, a beauty slider that can tweak your face, so to say, remove all the blemishes or other problems. Settings here, you can film in Quad HD, which is impressive for a front camera. Then there's gesture control, gesture control should usually involve flipping your hand to the camera to take a shot. Then there are the modes, selfie, wide selfie, virtual shot and interval shot. And that's about it when it comes to the front camera, that was a bit of a surprise, a pleasant surprise for that matter. Zoom goes up to 8x using the back camera and the level of detail doesn't quite drop. Uh, you can keep the screen pressed for the autofocus auto exposure option and let's get back here. Other than that I have to say that we got a fast focus and also a fast capture. Let's enjoy the pic I've just taken. This is the castle, the level of detail is quite good. You have to zoom in a lot till noise appears, sometimes it doesn't even feel like it's there, the noise I mean, so the quality is great. Now, we're not only going to judge this picture, we're going to judge a full gallery. We have taken a total of 152 shots using this device, including nighttime shots, daytime shots, selfies, inside shots, food shots, monument shots, everything one can imagine. So let's start with the, with the daytime shots. This is picture number one. It's a monument, so number one and then we start zooming in and zooming in and zooming in again and still the quality will not drop which is pretty impressive. Uh, the camera is still good with the sun in front of us, we got some realistic colors and good level of detail here, some more shots, good brightness and this is an HDR sample that only discreetly lights up this statue letting you see the details and some more colors here and the first attempts at the macro were quite good. I would recommend using the auto mode to take a macro and not the macro one from the pro area and then we get to the flowers that usually involve a few nifty macros. This one is a superb shot, if I'm not mistaken last year with the Galaxy S5 we took a shot of a flower colored just like this one and I was totally impressed by it. Well, this one is even more impressive you can go into crazy full detail, you can see even the micrograms of pollen if you want to be specific. Excellent macros for these flowers, also excellent colors and very realistic. Good lighting and here we apply the selective focus that will allow us to focus on the close-up 
or on the background so near focus far focus or everything in focus if you want that that was selective focus in a nutshell some more cool macros and then some more colorful shots we got good details good exposure focus and even the shadows are nice and the contrast the texture of these toys is very well seen the fact that this is a 3d object and not a 2d one is highlighted by these shots which is actually very nice this is that uh, virtual shot i was talking about before you can spin around an object and create this sort of 3d panorama which is quite cool okay let's go further some more toys captured some with macro some with without it good level of detail video shots as i said we have a huge gallery and we're not afraid to show it this is the panorama that's quite wide if i'm not mistaken it's about 180 degrees or even more is taken very fast very detailed there is no artifacts and the resolution is 16320 pixels over 1744 pixels very crisp and there isn't any curving effect that appears in some cases some more shots and then it's time to play with the selfies that will not only create a clear subject but also a clear background Usually the background was ignored in favor of the subject. This is a white selfie that can include even more people, even huge groups of people like you saw at the Oscars last year. Okay, now some more shots to faraway buildings and in lower light conditions. This is, um, for example, this picture was taken in a subway with dimly lit backgrounds. And I have to say that it's quite decent considering the conditions. You, all of you know how the subway is lit. And I have to say that the picture is quite decent again. And this one is a sample of HDR, so regular pick, HDR pick. You can spot the difference. Discreetly more lit and more clear. Also an example here, regular pick, HDR pick. Everything becomes sharper and a bit more lit. Yet another test. This one I liked more because you can actually see the texture of the rock that makes this wall. So that's nice an old building and the sun had already set so the shadows came in and still the photos were nice these are all daytime shots and we liked all of them now we move on to the night time so this is a picture taken at uh, let's say um, 12 a.m at night with the flash on superb details everything looks fine and then another shot and then pictures taken without a flash they were a bit of a letdown as you can see here the camera cannot handle the light source is very well, sadly, there's a bit of noise here, there's a bunch of blur. However, if you use the flash, you'll feel that you're taking daytime shots. The flash is that good and that powerful. The colors look pretty much okay for nighttime, obviously. And we even tried out some selfie shots at night, just to be totally unimpressed. Once again, this camera cannot exactly face light sources very well, sadly. We had two prototypes at our disposal, and this is prototype number two. With the first one, we actually achieved some very nice nighttime details, but overall, I would say the nighttime capture is below the performance of the Galaxy Note 4 and the iPhone 6 Plus, to be honest. Now, let's go to the shots taken with prototype number one. This is it, also at night, but a different Galaxy S6. You can clearly see that everything is well lit, and this one is actually a stunning photograph of a monument taken during nighttime. So once again, this is a pre-release version of the phone. So let's not yet accuse it of being a lesser device than the Galaxy Note 4 or the iPhone 6 Plus. Now let's go to the indoor shots. Of course, shots of food like everybody takes. Good details here. You can see the meat, the bun and everything. Crisp details. I hope you didn't get hungry because of this, but it's a pretty nice way of taking shots indoors in a restaurant. So that's about it as far as the photos are concerned. Prototype number one took some very nice indoor shots and nighttime shots. Prototype number two has taken some excellent daytime shots, but at night it didn't quite impress. Keep in mind that the selfies still look pretty nice. Now let's go to the video area. We have quite a few videos to show you. So video number one taken during the day. Let's actually close this one up. And video number one is this one here. This one is a full HD video, 30 frames per second. It's a crisp video with good stabilization. 
nice colors and nice level of detail. 70 mega per second bitrate and MP4 file. Then comes the second video. This one is a test of the stabilization. We keep walking. Once again a full HD 30 frames per second video. It feels like you're in a movie. No you're not. It's a Galaxy S6 filming and that's about it. We moved around. We walked briskly and yet the camera had offered excellent stabilization. By the way, when this was filmed we had optical image stabilization activated obviously. I would have to say that the optical image stabilization is on the same level as the one of the iPhone 6 Plus that was a landmark in our tests. Now it's time for a quad HD video. This is it. Pretty crisp, well lit, nice stabilization, nice image quality, details and colors. And since quad HD isn't enough, this one is a 4K video sample. Excellent acoustics and excellent colors. The sunset was coming, so there are a lot of shadows and still the camera handles them perfectly. The bitrate of this file is 50 mega per second, which is quite impressive, and we get a huge level of details here. It's even more realistic than the 4K videos snapped with the S5. By the way, the Quad HD video had 25 mega per second bitrate. And then, it's the turn of a 60 frames per second full HD video. It feels very realistic, it's like you're there. That's what 60 frames per second do. And then we obviously had to go and try out um, slow motion video. So let's go to the camera and try to find it. So this is the slow mo video. It's actually the fast motion video. So let's look for the other one. This is the slow mo video. With a creepy sound effect, just like the one of the Galaxy S6 Edge. And just like on iOS, you can choose the area where you want the slow mode to be applied. And let's go back to the fast mode to see it one more time. Okay, and uh, aside from that, you can obviously change the speed four times, eight times, or two times, however you want it. By the way, the slow mode capture was at 720p, 120 frames per second. And uh, we had one last video capture. This one here, it's an HD video where we tried out the zooming in and still it was pretty impressive. So the sun was already setting. We went out, find, found a colorful subject and started zooming in. Once again, this is merely HD, not full HD. And still the quality is very impressive. This is the maximum level of zoom right here and still it handles it quite fine. I have to highlight the good acoustics of this filming and we couldn't resist the temptation of filming at night which was equally unimpressive just like the photo capture so this is a video taken at night no special settings simply full HD there are lighting problems obviously there is a slight focus loss but the acoustics remain pretty good then we tried our luck with the flash on, with the results being a bit better, a powerful flash, the colors are clearly improved, also the details, still problems with the light sources that generate a halo around them, and once again good details and colors this time. Ok, we have one more video, this one here. If I'm not mistaken, this one should be in 60 frames per second, should be crisper, but I'm also not impressed by this one. You have to see them on YouTube, once we upload them, be sure to check them out. We do have a more impressive one, it's a video we've taken with the other prototype, and it looks better. This is a nighttime video capture, keep that in mind, and it's simply stunning. So once again, it depends on the prototype you're playing with, that's why we wouldn't rush to call it a disappointing device. So overall, I would have to say that during daytime, the videos look great, 
they're uh, I would say 10% better than, on, than on the Galaxy S5 and a bit over the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus while during night time we're below the Galaxy Note 4 and iPhone 6 Plus in the video area. Once again only a prototype and a pre-release device so let's not judge it too harshly. Overall as far as the entire, entire camera goes both photo and video it feels a bit below the Galaxy S6 Edge even at this pre-release phase and I doubt the final version will be able to surpass the excellent Galaxy S6 Edge capture. On paper they have the same camera but somehow the Galaxy S6 Edge we had for testing was a bit better which was kind of strange. Ok so it's time for the editing. The editing hasn't changed from the predecessor. We pick up subject, we press the edit option, we got auto adjust, crop, rotate, photo editor and collage, photo editor with the usual options for adjustment, tone, contrast, saturation, temperature and hue and some effects and that's about it. And now we have to talk about performance, obviously. We start off with the temperature, we played the game Riptide GP2, a 3D graphics title with all the levels set to maximum for 15 minutes in a row, we achieved a temperature of 35.6 degrees Celsius, which means the device isn't overheating, which is also very good. Now as far as the web browser is concerned, Let's load gsn1.com. The browser is fast. Scrolling is very smooth. And that's what the website is like in landscape. And we're obviously going to speak about the keyboard. The keyboard now includes bigger buttons than on the Galaxy S5. It's more ergonomic, it's easier to type on it, and the numeric row always helps. As far as the phone calling goes, there is a material design dialer here, we got speed dial, smart dial, very good signal and very loud calls plus clear and there is this option to jump straight to video calls if you want to. Ok, it's that time of the review again, the time for benchmarks and I'm going to talk a lot about them and I do mean a lot. I decided to compare the Galaxy S6 with the Galaxy S5, Galaxy S6 Edge, Galaxy Note 4 Exynos and the iPhone 6 Plus. Now we start off with Quadrant where we achieved a score of 36,419 points, the Galaxy S5 had 22,000 points, the Galaxy S6 Edge had 38,919 points and the Note 4 Exynos 26,312 points. In Antutu, a pretty impressive score, 68,079, the Galaxy S5 had 34,000 and Galaxy S6 Edge 69,856. Meanwhile, the Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 50,158 and the iPhone 6 Plus 48,000. It's the turn of Nanomark here, 59.4 frames per second, Galaxy S5 60.1 frames per second, Galaxy S6 Edge 59.4 frames per second and Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 59.7 frames per second. Next up is Valamo with an impressive HTML5 test score, 54.72 uh, excuse me, 5462, meanwhile the Galaxy S5 had only 1645, Galaxy S6 Edge 5726 and Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 4431. Then comes 3D Mark, we maxed out the iStorm test and meanwhile we also maxed out the iStorm Extreme and there was only the unlimited left. We achieved 22,141 points, while the Galaxy S5 was not very far behind with 18,632 and the Galaxy S6 Edge had 22,493. Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 12,812, probably not optimized and finally iPhone 6 Plus 17,925. This is Geekmatch 3, we achieved 1477 in the single core test and 5077 in the multi core test. Meanwhile, the Galaxy S5 had 854 and 2553, so the score has increased greatly. Galaxy S6 Edge, 1454 over 4717. Galaxy Note 4 Exynos, 884 over 3405. And finally, iPhone 6 Plus, 1629 over 2922, so the improvement is clear. Now we proceed to other benchmarks such as GFX that gave us a score of 46 frames per second in the 1080p T-Rex off-screen test while the Galaxy S5 had 27.4 frames per second, Galaxy S6 Edge 
had 55 frames per second and the Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 21 frames per second. Meanwhile the iPhone 6 Plus had 44.8 frames per second. There was also a speed test performed via Wi-Fi. We achieved 21 mega per second in download and 20 in upload while the Galaxy S5 had 23 over 24, Galaxy S6 Edge 21 over 20, Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 20 over 22 and finally iPhone 6 Plus 24 over 20. The browser tests were also done. In browser mark we achieved 2724 while the Galaxy S5 had 3250 but it was an older version and the Galaxy S6 Edge had 2706. Finally the Galaxy Note 4 Exynos had 2590. Sun Spider gave us a score of 528 and the lower the better here. Galaxy S5 had 413, Galaxy S6 Edge 538 and Galaxy Note 4 Exynos 875. Meanwhile, the iPhone 6 Plus wins this combat with 363. We also did a Base Mark S X text. Here it is, Base Mark S X, excuse me. And the result was 38,721, while the Galaxy S5 had about 23,000. The Galaxy S6 Edge had in the range of 38,520. Galaxy Note 4 Exynos, 24,000 points. And finally, iPhone 6 Plus. 32,000 points. The Samsung Galaxy S6 is a big jump from the Galaxy S5 as you notice through the results. However, this model only manages to win 2 or 3 out of the 11 tests we put it through, which is because of the Galaxy S6 Edge and its better results. If you were to exclude the Galaxy S6 Edge from the tests, this model would win 7 of the 11 benchmarks. Obviously, the handset has no lag as you can see in its brand new touch with interface and also games work just fine on it such as the Tether Riptide GP2 with all the 3D, 3D details set to maximum level. We got crisp graphics, nice lighting effects, nice water effects and a pretty good speed sensation. Once again, the 3D levels are all set to the maximum, maximum shader, maximum details, complexity of the scenery and all the best water effects one can hope for. Okay, so that's what the gaming is about on this device. Now I want to talk about the OS and UI on the phone. So we're dealing here with Android Lollipop in the flavor of Android 5.0.2 with the new TouchWiz on top. This brings a series of new icons and also a series of new widgets that you can see right here. An example of a new widget is this one here that keeps the battery, storage, RAM and security in check. And other than that, we got this home screen dedicated to Flipboard, which is already a familiar feature from a few devices ago. And other things we're mentioning is that the quick settings area and notifications area are unified. For multitasking, we now got a carousel that can either be closed with an X or it can be closed with a swipe or press close all to just close all. Other than that, if you pinch, you gain access to wallpapers, widgets, themes and more to download. A screen grid, you can customize your icon setup on the screen. And then I have to say that material design is felt here. You can feel it in this uh, dialer area. You can also feel it in a variety of apps. And also if you access an application here like, uh, I don't know, the calendar or several other calculator, you'll feel that material design I keep talking about. There's also the dual color uh, approach here. By dual color, I understand the status bar and the header of an application have uh, basically the same color but in different hues. The settings area now includes smaller icons in the list and hollow icons in the quick settings part. That's what I was talking about before, the dual color approach, a color for the header and a color for the status bar, the same color, different hues. There's also Samsung Pay as an extra, the new service from Samsung, and we also have a fingerprint scanner here that compared to the Galaxy S5 is a bit faster and more precise. So let's select lock screen and security, screen lock using the fingerprint, and let's do this. Okay, it's all set up. Now let's unlock it and see how efficient we can do that. 
as you just saw it was very fast and efficient so it's actually a bit better than the one of the Galaxy S5. However the setup process remains pretty annoying and pretty long, it takes much longer than on the iPhone for example. Ok, so no swipe involved right now, aside from the fingerprint scanner we also get um, um, other interesting things to look at here, by interesting things I mean the easy mode if you want an easier experience for the elderly or for the children and uh, let's see what else we got here motions and gestures the ones you already know from older devices direct call smart alert and mute and s health has also been improved with a new icon a new interface that frankly speaking is better organized you can keep track of your stress of your oxygen saturation and your heart rate that can be measured with this pulse scanner at the back with the addition here being that EKG like mechanism and frankly speaking I have to say that this is not exactly a very precise measurement because the readings vary very much you can also measure the oxygen saturation and your stress level other than that another novelty would be the presence of a smart manager which manages your battery, storage and RAM, cleans all and takes care of your security and then we got these bundled apps OneDrive, OneNote and Skype which signal a further partnership with Microsoft maybe in the future. Ok, other than that I have to say I am glad that there is less bloatware on board and now it's time for the conclusions. We are not going to give this device a grade, it's a pre-release device and as you just saw we tested two prototypes of the Galaxy S6 and their performance varied in the photo area. I have to say we get a very good display, very good photo taking as you saw in the gallery before, we got very good acoustics, a nice design, premium design, also a very good selfie camera, there's nothing to complain about that area here, however the Galaxy S6 Edge feels a bit better in some areas, for example its battery is clearly better and meanwhile the Galaxy Note 4 is clearly brighter than this handset, um, the fingerprint scanner takes a very long setup and the night type capture was a disappointment on the Galaxy S6 although as I said the quality of prototypes varies. If I were to give it a grade, a tentative grade would be 9.2 out of 10 for now. We'll have to test out the finalized version when it appears and then we'll be back with more details here at gsnlong.com. In the meantime enjoy this detailed preview and the tentative grade would be 9.2 out of 10 for the Galaxy S6. Bye bye!